Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. The subject of our last lesson was the deliverance of a demon-possessed boy. This happened after Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. After performing that miracle, we are told that the people were amazed at the greatness of God and marveled at all that Jesus did. While the people were distracted over their marveling at the miracle, Jesus took this opportunity to teach the disciples that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Then in verse 45 we are told, But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. I closed our last lesson looking at the last point of verse 45, where I briefly mentioned the subject of good leadership versus bad leadership. Of course, Jesus was the best leader the world has ever known, because as God incarnate, he was sinless and perfect. Every leadership decision he made was the right one, and he always dealt with people in the right way at the right time. Mankind has known many great leaders, but every single one of them was flawed. In one way or another, they made bad choices, had bad attitudes, and seriously defective characters. To lead people in the way of righteousness, the leaders must be righteous, and this is a huge distinction between non-Christian and genuine Christian leaders. Since we are all sinners by nature and by choice, every leader is flawed, makes mistakes, and sins. Our sinful nature will cause leaders to at times make bad decisions that will hurt people in the process. When leaders sin, the damage can be extensive depending upon their influence. Because Jesus was perfect, he did everything right all the time. If we want to learn how to be a good leader, whether for our home, church, community, or nation, then Jesus must be the example we strive to imitate. There has never been, nor will there ever be, a more loving, compassionate, and strong leader than Jesus. Since we are commanded to be imitators of Christ, then learning how he led should be very important to us, especially for those who are in some kind of leadership position. We can glean from the Gospels our Lord's leadership qualities and techniques and seek him for the grace to put his leadership style into practice. Leadership has more to do with who we are than with what we do. This is all about character, not a list of do's and don'ts. Now, I'm not saying there aren't other leadership techniques that we shouldn't strive to learn and put into practice. There have been many godly leaders that have much to teach us on how to lead well. Yet Jesus is our ultimate example and the one we are to imitate. In light of this, we must be very careful not to incorporate into church leadership secular leadership principles. This is mingling the sacred with the secular, which Scripture strictly forbids. Yet this is done all the time in the name of church growth. It seems like on a relentless basis, people come up with some supposedly new hypothesis that they turn into a big teaching campaign and then strive to spread it through the church. Denominations pick these up, looking for an answer to their decline in church growth. The common claim is that this new teaching will revolutionize the church. Yet it's just the same old worthless man-made concepts that didn't work in the past and won't work in the future. I have been in ministry for over 40 years and have seen an endless parade of these latest greatest church growth principles that in the end proves they are worthless because they are man-made, not God-inspired. Of course, each new church growth campaign makes a lot of money for those who come up with the supposed new paradigm. One of my biggest complaints about all the pop church growth movements is that leaders are taught how to grow a church without the power of the Holy Spirit. This is man-centered efforts to do what can only be accomplished through God-centered power that's obtained in the place of prayer. The erroneous idea is that if people can grow corporate kingdoms through the wisdom of men, then why can't the church do the same thing? The true church, however, isn't a corporation, it's a body, the body of Christ. Who is to rule the body of Christ? Jesus, who is the head of the true church. The secular world must never define how the kingdom of God is to operate. The rules of the kingdom of God are diametrically opposed to the fallen kingdoms of men. It's not the purpose of this lesson to prove how the Bible exposes the errors of the secularized church growth principles. Those who are genuine followers of Jesus are leaders to some degree, whether we like the idea or not. At the very least, people are watching us to see if our faith is real. Family, friends, neighbors, and co-workers pay attention to how we live and act. We are either going to be an excuse why they refuse to serve Jesus or part of the reason why they come to Christ. 
Some professing Christians are leaders in the business world or in some kind of political position. They may be a business owner, boss, or employee. As Christians, we are leaders because people are watching us, so we better pay close attention on how we are living before them. People can have more influence in our churches than is commonly understood, and this can be for good or bad. Church fights and splits happen because people of influence are using their influence to damage the church, and to damage the church is to damage the body of Christ, whose head is Jesus. This reveals that we need to learn how to be living epistles of the biblical faith so that people can read from our lives what it means to be one of Christ's followers. I got into the subject of leadership from what verse 45 said in that the disciples were afraid to ask Jesus about what he meant by his suffering in Jerusalem. Jesus wasn't a tyrant, but a good, loving leader that was dearly loved by those disciples. Their being afraid to ask about his coming suffering was at least in part out of love and respect. There could also have been some pride mingled in this. They were afraid to ask Jesus about those things they didn't understand about his suffering because they didn't want to appear ignorant. This is a distinct possibility given the story we are about to study. I didn't mention anything from the rest of verse 45 because we ran out of time. The subject of verse 45 is that the disciples did not understand what Jesus meant about his suffering in Jerusalem. We are then given the actual reason why they couldn't grasp what Jesus was teaching, and that's because the Lord kept them from comprehending it. I think this was for their own safety, and so that they wouldn't keep Jesus from accomplishing the work the Father sent him to do. This was a supernatural act where God incarnate kept them from understanding at that time what would not have been good for them to know. Yet after Jesus rose again, we are told in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and 45, He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Here's a miracle in the other direction, where Jesus gave them the ability to understand the scriptures in a way that they could have never done before. Jesus is still doing this today, where he gives understanding of the word of God to those who want to know his word and live it out. As I mentioned in our last lesson, the disciples predominantly knew the scriptures through the teaching of the rabbis and experts in the Mosaic law, but not the scriptures themselves. After Jesus opened their understanding, we see the disciples quoting scripture and having the ability to retain the word of God. Then they could accurately and powerfully preach and teach the word of God for the glory of God and the salvation of the lost. Because the Lord can give us power to understand the scriptures, it's a very good idea for us to ask him for this gift. Let's not be afraid to ask Jesus like the disciples were in the verse we have been studying. Now let's look at verses 46-49 through 49 of Luke chapter 9. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is the least among you all, he is the greatest. All three Synoptic Gospels record this event. Mark and Luke give an abbreviated version, while Matthew gets more involved in what Jesus taught on who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. This event is recorded immediately after the disciples were afraid to ask Jesus to clarify what he meant by his suffering in Jerusalem. This wasn't the only time this argument about who was the greatest came up among the apostles and disciples. The saddest account took place at the Last Supper, and this is recorded in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 30. This happened right after the Passover meal and after Jesus shared once again that he was going to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. Each time this argument came up, it exposed the carnal condition of the disciples, and this last one happened after their being with Jesus for over three years. How selfish and heartless we can be, even to Jesus. The Lord shares with the men his coming suffering, and what do they do afterwards? They argue over who's the greatest among them. Are we really any different than them? Not in the least. It's just that their pride, carnal ambition, and selfishness was written down for us to read, while ours isn't. The minor differences in the three gospel accounts of this event are easily reconciled in that each writer is presenting a different perspective of the event, and this is a common feature in the gospels. If anything, this only confirms their authenticity. If the gospel authors were fabricating the accounts of Jesus, then they would have sought to harmonize their stories, but they didn't. Luke gives the most generic account of the story. He doesn't give the circumstances that produced this event other than that the disciples were arguing among themselves over who would be the greatest. Mark recorded that the disciples were arguing along the road to Capernaum, 
than that Jesus confronted them when they arrived at that city. Matthew chapter 18 verse 1 tells us that at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Matthew didn't want to tarnish the characters of the disciples by mentioning that they were arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. It's a good possibility that when Jesus confronted the disciples over their selfish argument that they answered him with a question. Matthew recorded more of Christ's teaching on the subject of true greatness and the consequences that will fall on those who cause one of Christ's little ones to sin. In each account, the author, being led by the Holy Spirit, recorded what the Lord deemed necessary and would pass by what wasn't needed. There was the real necessity to keep the Gospels at reasonable lengths so that they could be cost-effectively reproduced. This may not seem important to us, but it was of vital importance in that day. The Holy Spirit, knowing this fact, would have inspired the authors accordingly. Before we get into the verses themselves, I want to give some reasons why this argument began in the first place. Let's begin at the root issue, which is the sin of pride, and pride is always self-seeking and selfish. This argument didn't happen because the disciples were humble and selflessly loving others. It broke out because they were loving themselves more than God and others. They wanted what they deemed was the best for themselves, and they obviously weren't preferring others. Their ideas about being the greatest came from the lies they believed about themselves and what came from their culture. Here's where the pride is obvious. Each of them thought that they were more capable to manage the most powerful positions within Christ's kingdom than the other disciples. This also reveals that they had very distorted beliefs about the kingdom of Messiah. They didn't really know what Christ's kingdom was all about or how it would operate. Though somewhat altered through Jesus' influence and teaching, the disciples still held to the typical Jewish view of Messiah that was prevalent in that day. By mixing together the Old Testament prophecies about Christ's first and second coming, they had put together a distorted picture of Messiah's mission and kingdom. They saw Jesus as eventually sitting on the throne of King David after ousting from power the Herod family and Romans. This would usher in a time of prosperity beyond anything Israel had ever experienced. Then the people of the world would look to Israel for spiritual guidance, and Jerusalem would become the center of the religious world. What does all this mean for the disciples and especially the apostles? that when Jesus rose to power as the king of Israel, that they would be elevated as well. One day the mother of James and John brought to Jesus a selfish, arrogant request that her sons would sit on his right and left when he came to his kingdom. In essence, she wanted one son to be the prime minister and the other to be the secretary of state when Jesus became king. His mother was seeking power, wealth, and secular prestige for herself and two sons. This is what all the arguing was over between the disciples. After three years of following Jesus and performing the hard duties of helping to get his message out, they thought that the time was coming when they would be rewarded for their sacrifice. It's not that they wouldn't be rewarded for their sacrifice, but it certainly wasn't going to come in the way that they thought. Their arguing over who would be the greatest also shows that they still didn't grasp the divinity of Christ. As God, he doesn't need prime ministers and secretaries of state. Yet some of Christ's teaching, if misunderstood, could feed these kinds of arrogant ideas, such as Luke chapter 17, where we find the parable of the minas. A mina is an ancient weight of money. In this parable, the faithful are given authority to rule over a certain number of cities according to how well they invested the Lord's money. One faithful servant was given ten cities to rule, another five. The scoundrel of the parable doesn't invest the minna the master gave him and finds that it's taken away and given to the servant that was rewarded with ten cities. I will wait to comment on this parable until we get there in our study. I just wanted to point out how the disciples could have taken some of Christ's teaching out of context and distorted them for their own selfish agenda, just like we can do today. It's far too easy for us to selfishly follow Jesus for what he can do for us rather than selflessly following him for who he is. None of us like being selfishly used by others, and neither does God. We know that the argument started while Jesus and the disciples were heading back to Capernaum, which the Lord made his home base for a good portion of his ministry years. Like naughty little children, they were arguing about a subject that they knew would displease the Lord if he overheard them. But he did hear their conversation, and that must have shocked them when they understood this. They had let their pride and selfishness get a hold of them, along with that arrogant competition where men can be brutal to each other. Well, women aren't exempt from this practice of evil either. After Jesus and the disciples arrived at Capernaum, the Lord confronted them over having this argument. 
He had to do this because they must learn that the kingdom of God doesn't operate the way the kingdoms of this world do. This is a very hard lesson for us to learn, and one we must regularly have refresher courses on, or we will revert back to thinking and acting like the world. Unfortunately, the church is full of the same worldly ambition that defines the world. This always grieves the Holy Spirit and hinders His move in and through the church. There are at least three separate accounts of their arguing over who is the greatest, and this is nothing other than pride, selfishness, and greedy ambition. These aren't the CEOs of secular corporations competing with each other, but disciples of Christ who are striving to position themselves for greater advancement in Christ's kingdom. We must see just how evil and subtle this sin is. We need to seek to comprehend how easily this creeps into our hearts and how it can define our theology and personal ambitions. This happens all the time with pastors vying for supposed better and more prestigious churches. It can be found in pastors' fellowships where their talk is all about who has the biggest church and who is seeing the fastest growth. We are no different than ancient Greece and Rome who are infatuated with hero worship. We have sports stars, movie stars, music stars, political stars, and yes, our ministry stars. Yet all human stars are merely shooting stars that will vanish away in a short period of time. For the church to have another hero than Jesus is a form of idolatry. With just a little looking, we can see a host of ways that the sin that produced the disciples' argument over who is the greatest is still going on today. The big difference is that we have made the argument acceptable and even noble while Jesus rebuked them for it. How Jesus responded to the disciples must have been disturbing because they had to understand that he knew what they were talking about. This is why Luke wrote that Jesus knew their thoughts. Though he reproves them for their gross arrogance, he does it in a sweet and loving way. Though this must have been a strong rebuke to them, they didn't learn the lesson because we know two more times that this jockeying for power went on. Our pride and self-love are more deeply rooted in us than we understand, and this account demonstrates the point. We can read on ancient Israel and their persistent backsliding and fail to see how we are no different. Our only hope is to cling to Jesus all the days of our life, otherwise we would be drowning in our own sinfulness and self-idolatry. A little child must have been near to where Jesus was going to give this very important teaching and had him stand before him. I would imagine that he did this in a very loving way so that the boy wouldn't think that he was being scolded. Jesus loves little children, and in a moment we will see one reason why. Then Jesus said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. The clarifying point of this sentence is that the people must welcome the child in the name of Christ. What Matthew recorded on this event will help us to understand what Jesus is teaching. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Here is another way of expressing that unless we are born again, we can't enter the kingdom of God. If we don't become like little children in humility, and this includes the absence of selfish ambition, then we can't be true disciples of Christ. The disparity between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdoms of this world is so great that there's nothing the two can agree on or share in common. The one must be forsaken to be a part of the other. The way the world rises in honor and power isn't the way of the kingdom of God, where honor is bestowed upon the meek and humble that resemble Jesus in character. In the very next point Matthew recorded, Jesus saying in verse 5, and whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Welcoming a little child is speaking of one who is humble and free from selfish ambition. We love the simplicity, innocence, and humility that are expressed in many children. When these traits are absent in the child, you find that the child is hard to like due to his or her obnoxious character. Jesus is equating that the character traits we see in children, which are truly beautiful, are also beautiful in adults. When we show love and kindness to humble, innocent, and unambitious children for Christ's sake, then Jesus will consider it done to himself. In Matthew, Jesus continues to apply the same truth to those who cause one of Christ's little ones to sin, and this is very serious. He will consider that act of leading others into sin as if it was done to him personally. Jesus expanded the idea of little ones to include his disciples. Yet for a person to lead others into sin is a very evil act that Jesus takes very personally and will avenge such acts against his person, kingdom, and creation. 
Jesus goes on to say in Luke, And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. When we love a child or disciple in Christ's name, we are loving Jesus. What we do unto Jesus, the Father will consider done unto himself. This is just another time Jesus expressing his divinity and equality with the Father. This thought can be applied in a positive or negative way. When we worship Jesus, we are worshiping the Father, for there is only one God who has revealed himself as triune. Whatever we do to one of God's children, we are doing to Jesus, and as such, the Father takes it as an act for or against himself. This is why there is no such thing as private sin, since the sin we commit against ourselves and others is ultimately done against Jesus and the Father. Then Jesus said something that is 100% contrary to the way we naturally think. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. John Wesley commented on this verse, stating, If ye would be truly great, humble yourselves to the meanest offices. He that is least in his own eyes shall be great indeed. I was recently at a church talking to a brother who had picked up a wheelchair-bound man to bring him to church. In passing, he mentioned that he had to help the man get dressed so that he could go to church. He washed the man's feet before putting on his socks and shoes. That was probably a greater work of service unto Jesus than any sermon I have ever preached. In God's eyes, that's true greatness, but in man's eyes, that's degrading. Yet that act of love which was done to that man was actually done to Jesus, and as such, unto the Father. We have become so proud and egotistical that we fail to see what God constitutes as true greatness, and as a result, few ever attain greatness according to God's definition. This is something we need to ask God over, that we might become great in His eyes, even if we are despised in the eyes of the church and world. Those believers given the greatest rewards in heaven may be those who were either unknown or were despised for the humble service they performed. It certainly won't be the supposed superstars of the Christian world. The Lord showed the disciples that they were all equal, and if they wanted true greatness, that it wasn't about position, fame, or power, but about being humble in service like Jesus. There's no real superiority among us except that which comes out of true humility. A few denominations make the unfounded claim, both biblically and historically, that Peter was the head of the church, and that his leadership position was passed down through each subsequent generation. The fact is that James was actually the head of the church in Jerusalem. Christ's teaching here dismantles the erroneous belief of a papal succession. According to Jesus, true greatness is the exact opposite. Whenever we see the arrogance, wealth, and love of power associated with religious leadership, then we know that Jesus has no part of it. This perverted, pharisaical concept of greatness has crept into a vast number of churches and denominations. Some of the most arrogant preachers and church leaders are among the most revered, their books sell the most copies, and their meetings draw the biggest crowds. Many have come to think that fame, wealth, and supposed success is equal to God's favor and divine approval, but they have been deceived. Jesus taught us something in these verses that are hostile to much of modern church culture, and we would do well to return to scriptures and the truths Jesus taught. The next incident recorded by Dr. Luke is found in verses 49 and 50. Master, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Who is the man that was casting out devils in the name of Jesus? Well, we have no way of knowing since that information is kept from us. There are, however, a couple of things that we can learn about him. First, he wasn't one of Christ's immediate disciples, but he was a disciple of Christ. Next, he was casting out demons in the name of Jesus. How would he know to do this unless he had heard Jesus preached, watched him perform miracles, and cast out devils? Third, the man was driving out demons, and this reveals that he had the power and authority to perform such miracles. The power and authority to cast out devils can only come from God, so he had received this gift from God. This means that the man was operating according to the will of God. Fourth, the man was operating by faith, which is pleasing to God. He believed the promises that God responds to our faith. Since true faith is an action word, it may be that this man was operating in greater faith than most of the disciples that were in Christ's entourage. Finally, Paul taught us in Galatians that faith operates through love, 
From this account, it could be implied that the man had a love for God that caused him to trust Christ, and that through his name he would have the authority to cast out devils. To this point in the birthing stage of the kingdom of God on earth, the disciples saw themselves as the ones who would perform such miracles, and I would venture to say that here was another expression of pride. Jesus just dealt with the disciples' pride over their argument of who would be the greatest. Now we see John and some other disciples expressing pride once again. He thought that only the twelve apostles and some of the other disciples would be the sole benefactors of Christ's power. John wasn't alone when this happened because he speaks to Jesus using the plural. John was just a spokesman of the disciples in this case. The disciples quickly turned into Pharisees by self-righteously forbidding the man to cast out devils. They didn't help him cast out devils, only rebuked him for doing it. It's crazy how selfish and proudful we get while thinking we are doing God's service. I think it's interesting that we are told the disciples tried to stop him, which seems to mean that they didn't succeed. The man must have claimed Christ as his authority to cast out devils, especially since it seems like he was having some real success. Those who had the demons cast out of them by this man of faith were very happy, even if his disciples weren't. Jesus answered them, Do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. It's obvious that the man was on Christ's side, so Jesus was on his side. The man wasn't a Pharisee or some religious zealot that was hostile to Jesus. The very aspect that he was casting out devils in Christ's name means that he acknowledged our Lord's power and authority. Jesus was teaching John and those disciples with him to not stop such people from doing the work God is empowering them to do. It's outrageous how some professing Christians will let people go to hell over their tenacious, pharisaical hold of a religious system. They are suspect of everyone that doesn't hold to their doctrinal persuasion. It's easy to become a Pharisee if we don't guard our heart and passionately pursue the love of Christ. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk